Welcome to your iconic image. If you want to take control of your image and be a power player in your space, then this is the show for you. Here we will arm you with tools and information to help you grow your brand on purpose. I'm your host, Marlena Semenza, photographer and visual strategist. Now let's dive into today's episode. Henry Sims is a self-proclaimed digital marketing nerd. His passion and implementation of digital systems and strategies has led to success for high-level business coaches and consultants, politicians, local businesses, and more, all under his growing digital marketing agency, Zesty Owl. Welcome, Henry. Hi. So first of all, I love Zesty Owl. Where'd that name come from? <laughs> uh, it came from being impatient and wanting a name quick and uh, wanting a name that was fun and not as boring as a lot of the other agencies out there. <laughs> well, I think you've succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to talk a little bit about how to increase our social media engagement, but let's back the whole thing up a little bit. And we all know that we need to utilize social media, but why? Why should businesses utilize it? Why should we as personal brands utilize it? Well, the simple answer is that there are so many eyeballs there. There are so many people on social media and it's free. So it's kind of one of those things that you're kind of like, well, why not try it? If there's people there and it's free, give it a shot. And so that was always my first kind of uh, answer to anyone who had hesitation of trying it out. It's like, it's not going to cost you anything. And there's lots of people there. So <laughs> it's worth giving it a shot. So then what type of content should we be posting if we are a business? And I use the term business to also mean us as personal brands, but what, where mm -hmm. should we go with our content? Content changes a lot, uh, but currently we see that a lot of educational content is very good as well as user created content. So this means that uh, we we almost kind of understand and know subconsciously what an ad looks like. Mm -hmm. And so as we're going through these social feeds, uh, we very easily skip past ads. And so by creating, uh, by putting out user created content of like testimonials or how they, like someone using a product or what they thought of something, uh, it's, it comes across as a lot more authentic and real. It doesn't look like an ad. And so that has a better chance of grabbing people's attention quite often, as well as educational content where people want to know what's in it for them. If they're going through the feed and something pops up, it has to be of value to them. And so by giving them something, by teaching them something, educational content does very well at grabbing people's attention and building that trust with them. So then how often should we be posting? That does change per platform, per audience. Uh, it, it just kind of depends. If you can find the right content and the audience you've got is right for it, then quite often there isn't a limit to how much you can post. Uh, but sometimes it can actually overwhelm people. They don't want to keep seeing the same kind of content. There's been... Um, business influencers that I very much love and respect. And I've followed them on certain channels. And after a while, I'm just like, oh my God, there's way too much of their content popping up all the time. And then I unfollow them. So it's, it's kind of a balancing act and it does depend on the platform. So, you know, Twitter is one of those platforms where posts don't last very long. And so you have to put out a lot more content to keep it out there and keep getting attention. Whereas YouTube, you could be okay with putting out one video a week. Mm. Is, is it different if, like you said, if the content is useful to whoever's mm -hmm. consuming it? So for mm -hmm. example, if we are just keep hitting them with asks or ads or, or things like that, they're gonna yeah. tune out sooner than if we're just giving them useful information? Absolutely, yeah. That, it, it's kind of like what I was saying, where if you're giving them what they want and it's that right person, then there's not really a limit to how much you can give them. But uh, a lot of people do kind of put out for businesses, put out too many asks. And so uh, one of the general basic rules that has been out there for a long time is kind of like the three to one 
ratio. It's like put out two or three pieces of content and then an ask or, or a promotional post and then back it up with another two to three pieces of content, educational value, all that kind of stuff. So there is that balancing act that you don't want to keep asking all the time because it there's no real value in that. What about honing our message for our customer or knowing who we're speaking to? Because, you know, I, a lot of people say, well, um, I, I don't want to niche down because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to lose anybody or things like that. What are the benefits of doing that and honing a message versus maybe not? Yeah, I actually did a video about this recently where I was talking about vanity metrics, those look good numbers, the likes and the follows and all that. And that comes to the content. When people don't want to really define their message and they'd rather just try and reach a lot of people, then you're diluting your message, which means for those people that do matter to your business, you're giving them diluted content. And so instead of trying to reach the masses and trying to semi-please everyone, it's better to really define your message and create that content that is geared towards those people that are right for your business because they will see that and it will impact them far more than your diluted content meant for everyone. So then talk to us a little bit about the difference between likes and engagement. As a data advertising nerd, I love that question uh, because likes, as we know, is that little button uh, that we push to say, yeah, we like this video. But in the advertising world, we can use likes to kind of see um, if we're making progress, if we are making better, more engaging ads. But the engagement can be anything. It can be them clicking see more to read the rest of your text on that post. It could be sharing it, commenting on it. It could be clicking the user name to see your profile. Those are all engagements. And it kind of depends on what stage of your advertising you're in, like what kind of, if it's a cold audience or if it's warm, but in that beginning, you're just really trying to get some engagement, get people to interact with your posts. So you don't too much care if they like it. If people are engaging with it, that's also a very good sign that it's grabbing someone's attention. It's enough attention for us to be like, okay, this person had some interest to it. So it's more of a back end kind of advertising metric that we can see, but it does, it does help you to know that not everyone likes posts. We, we're very, I don't know, we have a short attention span. So while we're flicking through, we see something, oh, cool, flick to the next. It doesn't mean we have to like it. And the percentage of people that actually do like posts is very low. Hmm. So knowing that people in the back end are actually just clicking around and sharing it around, that is very valuable to know. And uh, you can see that stuff with your ads. So do things... Do certain engagements count more than others? So for example, does a share count more than a like or a um, comment count more than a share or does it depend on the platform? Yeah, no, they do. They do value certain engagements higher than others. And so if you are, if you're playing a strictly organic game uh, for posting and you're not putting money behind it, then you definitely want to try and drive up the comments and the shares and those kind of engagements because those are very strong. A like is a very easy thing to do. Putting a comment takes more time. So these platforms see that as more uh, in involvement and more engagement, and they wanna make sure that that gets seen by more people because others are commenting and sharing it. So in the organic world, uh, it does help in the advertising world as well, but th those kind of engagements do uh, get valued higher than the likes. So then how do we get them? <laughs> By finding what kind of content your audience resonates with. And that's just a constant testing process. Uh, like we were saying earlier, video content where you're educating and giving value does very well. 
um, but also looking at websites like Buzzsumo and seeing what are the trending posts right now, what kind of posts are out there that are doing the best, you can see what they look like or what they sound like and try and replicate that for your message, for your audience. Uh, and that's a good way to search what other people within your industry are doing and uh, to see what's the most engaged content out there already. Is it a long end game? Like, for example, if, if you're just new to um, your brand or your business or whatever, and you're putting out content, do you have to also look at it that they need to get, they need time to get to know, like, and trust you and, and before they start engaging with you? Absolutely. Yes. So social media is definitely a, it, it is a long-term game to play. And there are, there are people who have followed my accounts and I haven't really seen any engagement or heard from them. And then months and months and months down the line, I'll put out a video and they'll message me saying, Oh my God, dude, I am so happy that you're posting this content. I've had people tell me that they've started businesses because of watching my content. So uh, they, they do build this trust over time and that kind of gets them to reach out and get involved more but uh, it definitely is, you, you do need to stage it. So mm -hmm. you want to be able to, with personal brands, especially because that's what you deal with a lot. You want to be able to show who you are as well as what you do. And that gives the viewers this kind of connection, some way that they can relate and connect with you and build trust with you. So that's where, that's why I like to put out a lot of content where I'm just showing myself racing a motorcycle on the track because that's what I do. I love doing that kind of thing. And I've had a lot of people connect with me because of motorcycles and it lead it into business. Right. So being able to show a bit of your personality shows who people are dealing with and it gives them a reason to be able to connect and trust you. Okay. So, because now I have to pull on that thread a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And I know what my answer to this would be, but I'm curious about yours posts with photos or without photos, which does better? I like posts with photos. That was the right answer, Henry. <laughs> Twitter, Twitter is one of those odd ones where it doesn't seem to matter as much, but photos are engaging and they help tell more than just text and they help portray an emotion differently than text does. It also, from just a pure advertising standpoint, it takes up more space in the feed. So as you're scrolling through, you have more chance of grabbing someone's attention by having a, a photo there instead of just text. Mm, agreed. <laughs> um, how often, in your opinion, let's say you were managing somebody's social media account and helping them with their advertising. Mm -hmm. For you, ideally, how often would you like to see them have new images for you to be able to use? That, I like to see new content frequently but it depends on budgets and audience sizes. So if, you're, if your audience is very small, say you're a, a brick and mortar and you've got like a five mile, 10 mile radius that, that you're trying to advertise to, it's going to be a lot easier and quicker to get that ad seen by everyone than it would be if you were advertising on the national scale. So, if, the, if you're getting people to see your ads sooner and quicker, you'll get ad fatigue and you need to refresh them. So it all depends on how big your audience is, what kind of budget you're working with. And that kind of gives you an idea of how often you need to change your ads so that you don't get this fatigue from your viewers. And mm. it does happen with the organic stuff. And that's why sometimes it's fun to switch it up and try a different kind of... Um, content type. And a lot of people right now are catching on with kind of the TikTok kind of uh, style of videos and are incorporating it into their business content just to kind of freshen things up and see how their audiences respond to it. So now that you brought up a couple of different platforms, what platform should we be on? Do we need to be on all of them? You don't need to. I find that it's not that much more work to be on most of them. 
uh, because you can repurpose the content all around. Uh, so I don't find it that much more work to post what you were going to post on Facebook on the other platforms as well. But uh, it does, you can look into some of my favorite websites are like uh, Sprout Social. And there's some other websites that will give you the demographic data of who's on these platforms. And you can definitely use that to understand the general kind of population that are on those platforms uh, that dominate those platforms to direct the majority of your efforts. And then once you've found that as your primary platform and you're making your content for that platform, you can still repurpose it on all the other platforms, but you do have a focus at least that you are trying to get a certain person on a certain platform. Mm. So let's say we've put out our content and I know this has happened to me on a couple of different platforms. All of a sudden it'll pop up and say, would you like to promote this post? Mm. Is it asking me that for a reason because it's doing well, or is it just asking me that to ask me that? (laughs) It's probably just asking you that to make money. (laughs) (laughs) So the, there are some with Facebook and Instagram, at least it will quite often say this post is doing better than others boost it. And it's not always true. And uh, a lot of the time they just want to get some money. And so uh, you do have to kind of, I prefer to look at the general kind of engagement that I get over time. And that way I have an understanding of something, if it really is doing better than other posts. And if it is, then yeah, I'll put some money behind it, but it, it, you, be wary of it. These platforms, that's how they make money. So when they say, uh, would you like to boost this post now? It looks really good. It's doing well, whatever. Uh, it probably is just a, a nice way of saying, please give us some money. <laughs> <laughs> so then how do we know if something is doing better than something else? So there are certain if we're talking about just organic content on our social media, uh, looking at comments and direct messages, uh, website views, those kind of things. And you can see those if, if you're thinking to yourself, oh, well, I don't, how do I see those? I don't see those anywhere. Uh, quite often you have to switch your accounts to what they call like a business profile or a pro account. And then it gives you those insights. You can do an Instagram post and you'll be able to see if people went and visited your website from them or how much reach did you get? If you got a really good hashtag grouping, then you may have got a lot more reach than you did on other posts. So I use those kind of metrics to see, okay, this is generally what kind of reach I get, what kind of engagement I get. But if something's getting website views or profile visits, then I'm, that's to me, I'm like, okay, they're taking another step to, they've seen a piece of content. Now they're trying to see who I am, or they're going to my website to see more. I'm going to put a little more money behind this post because it's obviously driving traffic. What about asks? Um, Asking for, um, you know, reply to this thread or DM me for this or good idea, bad idea, or it depends. Well, giveaways has been one of the most effective uh, strategies for growing social accounts. And you see a lot where someone will post and they'll say, uh, comment below and tag three of your friends or follow this account as well. And they use it to bring more attention in and get people involved. And that gets more reach and more exposure for their posts. Uh, so those giveaways do very well in the advertising world, at least with Facebook and Instagram, they don't really like you, uh, demanding interaction and they will kind of warn you of it, but, um, or they'll just kind of suppress the reach that you would get. So you're, you're basically paying more for less at that point, but organically it does very well. So I would say on, on organic, not using money, that's a very good uh, strategy to use to grow your channel and get involvement. And then advertising wise, not, not necessarily the need, or you just need to be careful of your wording. What about starting with an end in mind? Should we always have a 
an ultimate goal, like getting them to our website or getting them to a course or whatever it is we're doing? Yeah, I think so. There should always be a goal. If it's taking time in your day, then there should be some kind of goal to it. Even if it's just, even if it is just vain and you just want attention, then that's your goal. At least you know that. But you do want to have a goal uh, for what kind of content you're putting out. Why am I putting out this kind of post? Why am I putting out this kind of video? Is it to inform people of something? Is it to build trust? Is it to show some personality? Those kind of knowing those kind of content types is very good for informing yourself of why you're putting out certain content and why it would relate to your ideal client. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, there, there should be a goal. And if we're looking at kind of past that driving people to a website or a group, I like to focus on kind of one point and I've talked about it before called the spider web strategy, where anywhere someone finds you, if it's a podcast, if it's a social media channel, you're directing them to a certain zone. And a lot of people that zone is their website. If you can, if you can get people to your website and grab an email off of them for some kind of uh, valuable freebie download, then you've just got everyone directed to an email. And from there, you can now start kind of grabbing them into different zones and directing them how you need to. But it makes all of your outreach efforts a lot easier to manage. You're not trying to do different strategies in all these different areas. And for small businesses and personal brands, that can be overwhelming. So I like to tell them, focus all of your outreach towards one zone so that you don't have too much to manage. And it's very easy to analyze where people are coming from and what they're doing. So what are some of the best practices on different platforms? And I won't have you go through the umpteen zillion of them that there are, but like, (laughs) let's say, um, let's take Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, let's say, are there best practices for each of those platforms that, and um, for example, on Facebook too, should we be interacting from a personal page, a business page, um, a group, talk to us about, well, let's just take them one by one. Talk to us about Facebook first. Sure. So, well, in Facebook does have its nuances, just like every platform. Pages are great because you can put money behind your posts. It's very easy to start reaching more people. Uh, but groups and personal profiles have much better organic reach. So if you're not trying to put any money out there, then you're going to want to be in a group or on a personal profile. Personal profiles, you do have to be wary of being too heavy on your asks and your business because that's what the business pages are for. So if you get big enough or you get Facebook's attention somehow, they do have the ability to close you down. But uh, with groups, that is a defined description of what that group is about. So you can do whatever you want in that group and you'll still have amazing organic reach uh, instead of the business pages where you need to put money behind them to get that reach. So still sticking with Facebook, is there something that will get you into trouble real fast that we should avoid? (laughs) Um, Sending out far too many friend requests, being spammy with messages, um, being too heavy and bold with your promotional posts, language. They're very picky about <laughs> language, especially with the advertising. It's kind of like if your kindergarten teacher wouldn't let you say it, don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, it's every platform, every single one has user experience in mind. That's their number one priority. Um, that user experience brings people back which has eyeballs, which brings advertisers in and money. So they want to make sure that no one's getting offended. Um, no one's getting hurt. They're, they're all having a good experience on the platform. So they want to make sure you're not just spamming them, that you're not putting out mean content. And so those are the general red flags for any of the platforms. 
And okay, so best practices for Instagram and Twitter, any different? Twitter's very, um, uh, it's very in the moment. So there's a lot of news media, uh, breaking news that is on Twitter. So if you can capitalize on that and join in on conversations about things that matter to you, then you can spark up conversations and it just gets the ball rolling on Twitter. Uh, so they are very in the moment with Twitter. That's why you also have to post so frequently because it's just coming through at incredible speeds. Instagram being visual is very important. Uh, utilizing hashtags of all different sizes. The biggest hashtags, you're going to have the hardest time getting any attention because everyone's doing them. Mm -hmm. So if you can actually niche down on some very uh, defined, cool uh, Instagram specific hashtags, you have a better chance of reaching people who are also very much interested in that kind of topic. So with Instagram being visual and uh, trying to utilize these hashtags to get some reach with those people who are also interested in it does very well on there. And I know that hashtags are a whole thing in into themselves. And um, I know that you and, and another mutual friend of ours dive very deep into all of that. Are there any surface level tips for using hashtags that you can give us? Yeah. So the one, the first thing is to have your brand hashtags. So uh, for me, I've got my name and my company. So I've got hashtag Henry D Sims and I've got hashtag Zesty Al. And I have those in almost all of my posts and it helps to build up a content bank for anyone that gets involved with those ha hashtags. Um, it also I've found helps my search results on Google. I've seen uh, certain things popping up because of the hashtags being in there. It, it almost has this SEO boost to it. Uh, so that's very important. It's very big within the event industry. Using a hashtag for your event and promoting it gets a lot of eyeballs uh, and helps also build up that content bank. But um, yeah, I would say having your, your brand hashtags is very important. And then also when you're making up these hashtag lists, getting a variation of all sizes of hashtags, having some very small defined hashtags, as well as a medium sized uh, followed hashtag, and then the big ones. And that way you've got a chance of hitting people in each of those zones. And if it does super well, then it's just kind of going to build up and reach more people. Hmm, interesting. So I know that you have something called the social media fingerprint. Tell us about that. The fingerprint came about because I was starting advertising projects with clients and certain social media projects. And I noticed that their accounts were very confusing and that I didn't actually fully understand what they were trying to do with each of their accounts. So as I was fixing all of them, I realized that every one of them was having some of these issues. And so I put it into a checklist of uh, a way to structure your social media accounts and to make sure that they work with your overall marketing assets, make sure that they're working with your website or your podcast or your book. And that all of those kind of things are working together so that you've got this brand continuity. It's very easy to tell, yes, this is you on Instagram. Yes, this is you on Facebook. There's no changes there. And that we also incorporate the spider web strategy where everything is making sure that we're directing to a central zone so that no one's getting confused and shot in different directions. And so how do people access that? You can message me on any platform. I'm very active on Facebook. Uh, at Henry D. Sims on all those platforms, or you can contact me on my website, zestial.com. Perfect. Okay, Henry, four final questions for you. All right. First thing is, what's the best piece of advice you were ever given? Hmm. You know, the best one that I ever got that actually got me going was you can't steer a parked car. 
And that was the first one. Cause being the analytical that I am, I always wanted to formulate the perfect plan before getting started. And it just got me stuck. Like I never really got started with it. And when that guy told me that you can't steer a parked car, you just got to get going and then you can adjust as you're going, uh, that started everything. And so now there's still things that I'm running into that I didn't know existed that I had to address because I'm moving. And so now I can address it, formulate for it and go. (laughs) Love it. Share with us one thing on your bucket list. I want to go to Whistler in British Columbia and hit their downhill mountain bike park. It's one of the most famous and gnarly in the world. And I want to be on it. Yeah. And if anybody hasn't figured it out by now between the motorcycle references and that reference, and if you follow Henry on any social media, he's a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Just a bit. (laughs) Um, When the toy companies finally get around to making an action figure of you, what two accessories will it come with? A motorcycle (laughs) and a laptop. Love it. And last one, Henry, one more time. How do people find you? At Henry D. Sims on any of the major social media platforms, or you can contact me through my website, zestial.com. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thanks for being here, Henry. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Once again, I'm Marlena Semenza, photographer and visual strategist. Please comment, like, or share this episode, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. For more information on how I can help you create your iconic image, visit marlenasemenza.com.